I have that cold, and I spilled my water, so it's doing great so far. But happy Halloween, Brooks. Thank you. I'm a spider today, in case anybody's wondering. I wanted to start today by continuing the tradition of adults sharing photos of themselves when they were little. So this is a photo of me in my all-time favorite Halloween costume, Dracula. <laughs> um, this is me before going trick-or-treating when I, I think I'm like seven years old in this photo. And my eyes are closed, in case you're wondering, because I was a vampire and because the sun was still up and because I was trying to not get evaporated like vampires do when they see the sun. Um, and for the record, it worked because I'm still here today. <laughs> I know, right? Happy Halloween. And that's also, honestly, probably the last time I wore makeup, but that's a whole different chapel speech. Um, I have a bunch of different roles and job titles here at Brooks. But one of my favorite ones is my most unofficial one. I am the school's Dean of Halloween, which is a title I inherited from Mrs. Reese a few years ago. Um, it's a pretty intense job. As Dean of Halloween, I coordinate Halloween festivities on campus, which is mainly the trick-or-treating by the children of the adults who work here at Brooks. So tonight around dinner time, you'll see a whole group of little kids running around campus trick-or-treating at residences, at dorms, the day students have a post, and at campus buildings. Um, and a lot of people are helping to make this year's trick-or-treating a massive success. And I want to say thank you to all of you. It means really a lot to the little kids here. And it means a lot to me personally. I see you all, and I really appreciate it, so thank you. Halloween is one of my favorite holidays. I love that we spend a night each fall watching scary movies, making jack-o'-lanterns, dressing up in costumes, and sending our children out into the night to demand candy from the neighbors. But really, we're doing more than that. I don't know if you guys are Office fans, right, but the great Michael Scott of the Office fame once said that Halloween should be a day on which we honor our monsters and not be mad at each other. And he's right. And Miss McLaughlin gave an excellent speech last week where she talked about the season that Halloween falls in. And I'm going to repeat her for a minute because it was so important to amplify what she said. So Halloween happens at a certain time of year, this time of year, right? It's that gray area between fall and winter, between the long days and the long nights, between growth and dormancy, and between this life and the life after. From its earliest origins, Halloween has given us a space to talk about the scary things in life, the unknown things, the mysterious things. Throughout its history, Halloween has also given people a chance to congregate, to get together with their neighbors, and to celebrate the bonds and strength of their community before they go back into their houses and shut their doors against the ever longer, ever colder night. And humans have a primal, a natural fear of the dark, right? When it's dark out and we can't see anything, our animal instincts kick in, and we fear the danger that may be out there just a few feet away that we can't see. Night leaves us vulnerable, and for much of human history, the night has meant danger and the unknown. It's something to be scared of, something to protect ourselves against, something to avoid as much as possible. Brooks, we're going to talk about that today because today I want to offer the night, the dark, and fear itself not as something to avoid and protect yourself against, but as something to welcome as we each continue to grow, learn, and become stronger. We've seen an example of these themes of community and finding space for the unknown with today's awesome presentation by Marco and Angie and Alianza Latina about the Day of the Dead. And thank you guys for that. I want to talk briefly about another example, an ancient Celtic festival. So the Celts, right, they lived in Northern Europe about 2,000 years ago, and they celebrated their new year on November 1st. Okay, the summer was over, the harvest had ended, and the winter, a dark, cold, scary time, was beginning. And on the night before their new year, so the night of October 31st, the Celts also believed that the wall between the living and the world of the dead became permeable, and that ghosts and spirits would return to the world of the living. To these ancient people, this night before the new year encompassed a lot of really heavy emotions. It was a celebration of a bountiful harvest, an acknowledgement of those they had lost, an uncertain hope for the future, and a collective shoring up 
against the coming winter. And they built huge bonfires, like the one on the next slide, thank you, at which they gathered to celebrate their community as much as they did its ghosts. When the celebration was over, each household would actually take a torch from the bonfire and relight its own fire at home with it. And I'm an English teacher, I love this symbol, right? They took a part of their community home with them to help them stay warm during the cold, dark winter to come. So that's great, but why does this matter today? I know what a lot of you are thinking. It's the year 2022, and we're a really far cry from giant bonfires marking the end of a harvest season and the beginning of a dangerous, scary winter full of doubt, questions, and mysteries. We pretty much have it all figured out, you're thinking. In fact, these days, almost everyone in the world has a smartphone. In fact, more than 7 billion people around the world, which is more than 90% of the world's population, has a smartphone. And I know that because I Googled that on, say it with me, my phone. Thank you, my iPhone, yes, my smartphone. So, almost the entire human population has the entire body of human knowledge literally in the palm of our hands, immediately available, unless we're walking up and down Main Street here at Brooks School. We can talk to family and friends on the other side of the world. We can open up our laptops and watch a live stream of a protest happening on a different continent. We can zoom in on a manuscript in a library across an ocean. All the music, all the poetry, all the stories that our delicious minds, hearts and souls have ever created and loved is right there, it's waiting for us. And as we've learned over the course of the pandemic, we can also use our phones, laptops, other devices to stay together, at least in part, to stay connected to our community, not in all ways, but in some ways, to reach out across distance, time zones, continents, fear, and disease, to hang on to some pieces of each other, to help us all through our loneliness, to help us through the dark, to keep us all moving toward the sunrise again. And it's not just our ability to access information and each other quickly that's changed since the days of the Celtics. We know a lot more about how our world works now than we used to, and we know more about how to manipulate it. Even in just the last few years, the scientists at Harvard have isolated the genes of a woolly mammoth that was encased in a glacier, so it's an extinct species, and they can now theoretically, hopefully not in real life because Jurassic Park, right, but hopefully not in real life, but theoretically they can recreate them and grow a mammoth in this modern era. A couple years ago, this kid, whose name is Haley, threw out the first pitch at a World Series game using a hand that was made on a 3D printer. And we're gonna look uh, past the fact that Haley, who appears to be really darling and wonderful, she might be a Houston Astros fan, we wanna ignore that for now. Space tourism is no longer a possibility, but a reality. And we know for a 100% absolute locked in certainty that a year from now, on October 14th, 2023, a solar eclipse will cross over North and South America and the sky is going to get dark in Eugene, Oregon at 8.06 a.m. because scientists can calculate the exact movements of the Earth, Moon, and Sun down to the second. Now, we could look at all this and say that we've got it all figured out, that we're totally in control of our world and our lives. We've found ways to negate extinction, disability, nature, and even the vacuum of outer space. We have no more questions or doubts, and at least here at Brooks, a dry summer or an early frost won't seriously affect our chances at surviving the winter. We don't have questions, doubts, or mysteries. We don't need the light of that bonfire. But the thing is, we don't really have it all figured out at all. And as we all know, now that the pandemic is a large part of all of our stories, we really do need that bonfire. In fact, we don't know the answers to some pretty basic questions about our world. For example, although we have figured out how to bring that woolly mammoth in a glacier back from extinction, scientists have a surprising amount of trouble explaining why the ice it was trapped in for so long is slippery. We can build prosthetic hands on a 3D printer out of literally nothing, but we don't really know why some people are right-handed and some people are left-handed. We can predict the exact movements 
of these immense celestial bodies that are millions of miles away, but nobody knows for sure how many animal species exist here on Earth. We're sending paying customers into outer space, but we haven't explored 90% of our own ocean floor. And we also don't know the answers <coughs> to even more primal, more lizard brain questions about ourselves and our world. Like, for example, what is that thing that you see in your peripheral vision sometimes? Why can't you really get a clear look at it? What does my dog see when she growls into that corner of the dining room late at night after everybody else has gone to bed? That tapping sound, hi PDA, that tapping sound you hear in your dorm late at night, is that really just the old radiators? Why do we sometimes feel like there's someone, there's something right behind us, catching up to us, reaching for us, even when we know for a fact, for a scientific, objectively true fact, that we're alone. Maybe this is why my daughter, who is 10 and who is in the fifth grade, and who has definitely learned a decent amount of science already at school, has trouble falling asleep without her fairy lights on. Shout out to Laura and Jaden and their freshman year fairy lights in Merriman. Maybe this is why all the kids in my seven-year-old son's day camp group here at Brooks ended the summer completely convinced that a witch lives in that tiny brown house across the lake from our boathouse. I see you smiling because I know that from what I hear, they are not the first group of Brooks summer day campers to believe this. Maybe this is why I avoid my dining room when I'm the last one awake in my house at night. This crack of doubt in the sturdy foundation of what we know, the foundation of what we know we know, or, or maybe what we maybe kind of think we know, maybe this is what today's Halloween is all about. We set aside time to acknowledge our doubts. We set aside time to name what we're scared of and just let ourselves be scared of it. We set aside time to let ourselves just not know all the answers and not have total control over our world. And we set aside time to do this as a community, together, around a metaphorical bonfire and very real jack-o'-lanterns. And I'm really proud of my kids' jack-o'-lanterns. You guys are gonna love them, all right? They're amazing. For one night, we reassure each other that, well, I also don't know what the dog sees over there, but wow, that's pretty creepy that I'm also not so sure that noise is just the radiators. And I wonder also, that maybe I think I might have also seen a light flickering out there across the lake one night. You're not the only one who gets scared. You're not the only one who doesn't know the answer. And you're not the only one who has questions. Halloween is a chance to celebrate with each other that, even though we know so much about our world, and we have so much access to information, art, beauty, knowledge, and each other, we don't know it all. We celebrate this today. We're vulnerable. We can be frightened. We're human. But it's okay because we can be unknowing and vulnerable and frightened and human together. It's 2022, and we still come together as a community, a campus, a bunch of employee children trick-or-treating, <coughs> We still build our bonfire and light our jack-o'-lanterns. We still say hello and smile as we pass out candy. And we each go home with, if not a literal torch for our fireplace, the knowledge that we're not alone and that we'll be there for each other through the winter and the long nights that are coming. Once in a while, times are hard and things are scary. All of the time, we can offer compassion and love and we can help each other as best we can. Once in a while, we're not sure why things happen the way they do. All of the time, we can ask our questions. Once in a while, we do the wrong thing. All of the time, we can remember that we're not perfect and that we're not built to be. And we can give each other grace and space to make mistakes. Once in a while, once a year, it's actually October 31st, it's Halloween. All of the time, we can celebrate the dark and all the truths we don't know. All of the time, we can name and own and be proud of our fears and questions. All of the time, we can get together to celebrate our own humanity. We can celebrate its perfections 
we can celebrate its imperfections. And all of the time, we can bring a piece of our community home with us to help keep us warm when we're alone and in the dark. Happy Halloween, Brooks. Thank you. Thank you.